Hey guys, Winston at Carbide3D here. In our last episode of the Carbide Cruiser Saga, we'd wrapped up the design of our longboard and acquired the materials to make it. Today, let's talk about some of the toolpathing strategies we use to machine it, specifically the top of the longboard deck. I started with the deck because it's the largest piece and the one that'll take the longest to machine. I would need two relatively straightforward setups for it, one to machine the top and one to machine the bottom. Since I'd be relying primarily on double-sided tape for work holding, I planned on machining the top side first. That way, after the flip, I would have the largest possible surface area to load up with more tape. I first defined my stock to be 32 by 8 inches in X and Y respectively, and a half inch thick plus 10 thou on top. My material is a tiny bit thicker than half an inch, so that 10 thou margin helps prevent the first step down of my facing toolpath from cutting deeper than expected. Before we dive into specific toolpaths though, let's take a look at the end mills I'll have at my disposal. My primary roughing tool is this quarter inch single flute coated end mill number 278 in the carbide catalog. Single flutes are great because they provide ample room for chip clearing. Even without air blast or coolant, it's almost impossible to clog the flute. For shallow cuts and finishing, I'm using the 203Z cutter, a coated quarter inch three flute stub end mill with a relieved shank. The shorter flutes make the tool stronger, and having three flutes means you get three swipes at the material per revolution of the cutter, so if you're targeting a particular chip load like with finishing, that lets you feed faster than you could with a one or two flute. For smaller features, I'm using the 102Z, our coated eighth inch two flute end mill. For 3D contouring, I'm using our standard 202 quarter inch ball end mill. For chamfering and countersinking, I'm using a three flute quarter inch shank 45 degree chamfer cutter. Operation 1 was to face my material down to within a couple thou of my model top. Bar stock is not something you should trust to be perfectly flat. Not only can your material be slightly cupped or bowed like with lumber, but the thickness can also vary from the outside to the inside. My cuts here would all be very shallow, so chip evacuation wasn't much of a concern, so because of that I'm using the 203 cutter. Because there's about 25 thou of material to remove, I had originally thought to do this with an adaptive clear, but later I'd switch to a regular facing operation. The adaptive toolpath spends just a little too much time not cutting. This could have been mitigated by enabling both ways cutting, but on a platform like the Shape Oko, I strongly prefer climb cutting only. While I had the 203 cutter installed, I'd be rolling right into the finishing pass for the top of the deck. I targeted a 1 thou per tooth chip load and a step over of 60%. And the last toolpath with the 203Z installed would be to rough out the pockets in which I would inlay grip tape on the deck. Then it was time to switch gears to cut out the skateboard profile. As a lover of adaptive toolpaths, I still had to concede that 2D contours would be the fastest way to get through my stock, but to use them in a way that would minimize any drama, I opted to use them with a roughing pass enabled until I got within a cutter diameter's distance from stock bottom. This way, I would allow the end mill to have a little extra clearance for chip evacuation and reduce rubbing. My last act with the 278 cutter would be to do a finishing pass along my walls, stopping just past where a chamfer on the underside begins. There's no need to tidy up stock that's just going to be roughed away later. Now, I could stop here, but I want these inlay pockets to be defined more sharply. These radii need to be smaller. So, I loaded up my 102Z and first hit just the corners with rest machining. By clearing these areas, my subsequent contour finishing toolpaths will encounter only very light resistance. I also needed to put in some holes for the longboard trucks, but that's not the only feature I need to machine here. These holes are going to be countersunk so the screw heads sit flush with the deck's surface. To do that, I would first rough out the countersink so that my chamfer tool would have less material to cut away. And speaking of chamfers, there is also a generous sized chamfer around the perimeter of my part. I was admittedly a bit foolish here and modeled it taller than the height of my chamfer tool so I found myself having to run two passes with different offsets so I could cover the entire chamfer. And I ran those tool pads twice, the second time as a spring pass. The first time you cut any features, there will be some deflection, and because the upper and lower passes will experience slightly different cutting loads, they'll leave different marks on the walls. So that spring pass shaves off anything left over until the entire chamfer is brought to its intended dimensions and appears smooth. Alright, I think that's enough cam for one day, let's go to the CNC. Before doing anything, it's important to ensure that you start with a surface that is dead parallel to your CNC's axes. Machine leveling your wasteboard is highly recommended for projects that will span your entire work area. To attach my stock to the wasteboard, I would be using double-sided tape. The reason for this is that I need complete access to the top of the part, and I would also be contouring around my part, so nothing could be in the way. I'm also taking some additional steps to maximize my odds of success. First, I'm using Air Blast via a cheap hydroponic air pump. 
A steady stream of air blowing on the end mill will help clear out chips and, to a much lesser extent, cool the cutter and workpiece. But first and foremost, we are worried about chip evacuation here. I'm also misusing a dust chute to block chips from flying everywhere. Realistically, chips will find their way into the strangest of places, but using this dust shoe as a shield does help. Later on in this project, I would take additional precautions like improvising chip guards for my V-wheels. Chips tend to slide off the rails because of their slope, but if they fall right on or in front of the V-wheels, they will get run over and embedded in the Delrin. This isn't a problem for smaller projects, but when you need your CNC to run reliably for 10-hour machining sessions, you want the odds stacked in your favor. And one last precaution I took was to cover my router. Aluminum chips flying at high speed will bounce around and some of them will land on top of the router. These can pose a short circuit hazard if they build up in places they're not supposed to, and also accelerate erosion of the motor brushes. A fine mesh would be a much better choice to catch chips than a cotton sock because it's much less restrictive for airflow and easier to clean, but here I had to improvise. Alright, let's get to the machining. First things first, facing. You can see quite clearly where the high and low spots of my stock are. For final finishing of my deck, I used a pocket operation so the machining marks would match the shape of the board. Next, the grip tape pockets. And then it was time to contour around the part. Because of the sheer size of this longboard, using an adaptive slot around my part would have incurred too much of a time penalty. So I did the next best thing and used a contour with a roughing pass for the majority of my profiling. The downside to this is heat generation because you're forced to make a smaller chip. My stock got noticeably hotter on this operation, but not enough to weaken my adhesive work holding to the point of failure. When I got near the bottom, I switched to a plain contour operation. It's faster to skip the roughing pass, and I trust the 278 cutter to go at least one end mill diameter deep in a full contact contour operation. With the outer profile of the board established and excess stock liberated, I can now use an adaptive toolpath to rough out my chamfers in an efficient manner without constraining it between two boundaries and causing the toolpath to have to use short arc movements. Then I swapped in my 8th inch cutter to clean up my inlay pockets, pre-rough my countersinks, and bore out my 3 16 inch holes. I wanted to get as close to 3 16 of an inch as possible without oversizing them because these holes would be used for indexing my part after I flipped it over. If they were too snug, I could always open them up by hand with a drill. And finally, the chamfer cutter was loaded up. I went around the perimeter of my longboard with this tool and finished up the countersinks that I had started with the 8th inch end mill. One thing to note here is that American fasteners don't fit a 90 degree countersink. The standard countersink angle for most of the hardware that you see and that you would buy at the big box store is 82 degrees. Fortunately, when engineers were creating the standards for metric fasteners, they decided that a nice measurement of 90 degrees made the most sense, so this longboard will be held together with M5 hardware. And that wraps up the machining of the Carbide Cruiser's upper deck. Total time to mill is about four and a half hours, so comfortably an afternoon job. In the next episode, we'll flip the deck over and attack the other side, but until then, thanks for tuning in, good luck on whatever projects you might be working on, and have fun machining, folks.